What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's lesson. Today, we're going to do something a little different. We are going to explore what I consider to be the top five transcribable J.J. Johnson licks. So as jazz trombone players, and really as all trombone players, J.J. Johnson has got to be one of the foundational figures that we want to deal with. For my money, he is the most important, influential jazz trombone player. And also for me personally, he's my favorite jazz trombone player. So today, we're going to dig into... What are some of the great passages that he played in the recorded history of his playing? We're gonna cover a broad scope of his career. These are by no means like the absolute only things you should learn for J.J. Johnson transcription, but these are some of the, I think, the go-to um, type of ideas that really typify his style and a great place to start when you're thinking about working on transcribing his body of work. All right, now throughout this lesson, um, to avoid kind of any copyright shenanigans, I'm actually gonna play these licks. These are all solos that I transcribed at some point in my career so far. And uh, for this lesson, I kind of picked some, worked them back up so that I could play them well. A few of them are a little technically challenging. And so we're gonna go through a few of them today, talk about why they're so great. So number one is from the tune Barbados. This is a blues uh, in F. It is found on the album, dial JJ5. Now, I actually have this on a box set from all his Columbia recordings, so that's actually where I encountered it. So you may find it on a different album, but um, surely if you search for JJ Barbados in YouTube, it would be one of the first things that come up. So this little passage is kind of actually like three licks in one. There's kind of like three distinct great ideas here, but they all occur like right back to back. So I'm just going to play all three of them. This starts at about a minute into his solo. So let's check it out. <laughs> All right, great. So that's kind of near the second half of the blues form, getting into the turnaround. He does a few really cool things in there. First of all, he plays this triplet figure, ascending just kind of diatonically in F. And then when he gets to the top, rather than grouping it in triplets, he starts to group it in four note groupings. And so you're kind of going up nicely in triplets. And suddenly he just takes a total left turn and just kind of like, you know, breaks your ankle there for a second um, when he groups those in four note groupings rather than in triplets. Great idea. All right, second thing in this solo that I said was great, or this particular passage, is the 251. If you're a trombone player, to me, that's like must know vocabulary. Um, if you don't know it, learn it now, transcribe it, put it into all 12 keys, get that in your playing. All right, the last thing in this solo that's so great and I think really typifies his way of playing is in the first four bars of the next chorus, he does a great job of outlining the chords, but in a super melodic fashion. Um, his playing, I think, is typified by this sort of melodic approach to playing bebop. So check this out. He goes an octave jump, C to C, on the F7 chord. Then our B flat 7 chord, he goes B flat to B flat. But we really have this nice melody. Then we resolve down the A of the next F7 chord. So it's great voice leading. And even though he separated it by octaves, um, that kind of gives it some interest. It's really just a nice little good voice leading melody through the chord changes. And he does have a nice 2-5 um, at the end of this uh, particular line and then lands on the sharp left of the, of the B-flat 7 chord. And that's nice as well. But I really think it's that melodic content that is important here and really typifies his style. All right, on to line number two. Um, this one is from the recording of Yesterday's that he did on the Live at the Opera House album. Now, this is probably one of the definitive JJ albums for most players. Um, and this track in particular is one of my favorites and one of the uh, first ones that when I was maybe end of high school, beginning of college, that really just like lit my fire for really wanting to deal with JJ. So let's check out a little bit of an example here um, and talk about, again, why this solo is so important. This is going to start at about a minute 15. This is uh, near the beginning of his solo. <laughs> Now, the reason I think this is so important is I've definitely heard some trombonist um, kind of knock JJ over the years saying that he doesn't really play bebop, doesn't really play changes, that he mostly plays melody. And I couldn't disagree more. 
he's playing a lot of bebop in this particular um, passage in this solo. Check out the A7 chord. That is as bebop as it gets. He's playing chord tones, he's ornamenting them with sometimes enclosures, approach notes, things like that. He goes up that arpeggio to the flat nine, then this nice resolu little resolution to the D7 chord. That is playing the changes. To further kind of drive this point home, uh, another great album to check out that we're not going to talk about today necessarily is the Miles Davis album, um, Live at Birdland 1951. JJ is on a couple of those tracks. They're live, so they're not maybe as transcribable because a little hard to hear clearly um, what he's playing sometimes. However, he is really playing some bop on that album. Tempos are fast, and he is just playing streams of eighth note lines that we think that typify this style in a really great melodic and smooth sort of fashion. Okay, lick number three that you want to make yourself aware of if you are a JJ novice. This is from the tune Mysterioso. Now, he recorded this a number of times over his career. This particular example is from the album called The Trombone Master. Um, this particular idea he plays a couple times in this solo. Um, the specific context of when we're going to play it is at three minutes and 45 seconds, about there. Now, this is like a straight up kind of like greasy blues idea. So let's check it out. Now, if you go and listen to the original recording, you notice that he plays it quite a bit faster than I do. In all honesty, I don't know if I can play it as cleanly as he does at the tempo that he does. He just really rips it super clean, um, but it's this great blues idea. Again, something that really typifies JJ's style, I think. Melody, hitting the changes in a melodic way, and really leaning on the blues to kind of fill in a lot of the rest of that space. And to me, that is what makes jazz happen, are those elements. An interesting side note about this particular idea, if you check out the Michael D's recording of the tune Blues on the Corner, um, you will hear his solo start out with an idea that is remarkably similar to this. And I happen to know that um, he is a great student of the music, so there is no doubt in my mind that he knew exactly where that line was coming from, whether he did when he played it or whether if looking back at it, he could say, oh, yeah, that's a JJ line. I stole that from Mysterioso. Um, I am almost sure that that is the case just because he is somebody who really respects the tradition and knows the tradition. All right, moving on. Number four. Now, this one I picked and put it on this list, not necessarily because it's the hardest lick to play or something like that, but because whenever I play students this recording, um, they're always drawn to this measure. This is the tune Coffee Pot off of the Eminent J.J. Johnson Volume 2. Um, this is oftentimes one of the first listening examples I use with students, regardless of style, just because it's great trombone playing all around and it's fast, so a lot of times it gets younger players' attention, um, that type of stuff. And whenever we get to this measure, it always perks up young players' ears. That's about 45 seconds into the tune. And he used, again, kind of a blues idea, but he uh, plays it kind of as a hemiola where he's kind of displacing it over the measure. So it gives it this like interesting rhythmic feel. And then he lands right on his feet. And again, every time I play that for a relative beginner trombone student, I ask them, well, what was interesting about that recording? Um, they almost universally point to that spot. All right, we made it all the way to number five. So this one is all the way near the end of JJ's career. This is from the album Live at the Village Vanguard, Quintergy. Now there are two of these albums. One is called Standards, one is called Quintergy. Quintergy is admittedly the more challenging one to find. I have this on a CD, like an actual CD. Um, I've never been able to find this one uh, elsewhere online, but this is a great recording and both these albums are really great. And actually some of my favorite JJ playing happens on these two recordings. His sound is just so rich and full at this point in his career and everything is very, very distilled. Um, there's not kind of a lot of extra garbage in this playing. So this is a tune called Bud's Blues, and if you can find the recording, you'll know that it is actually just a duet between he and the bass player, who's Rufus Reed in this case. Um, and it just provides a real interesting setting, and you can really hear some great interaction between he, uh, J.D. Johnson, and Rufus Reed playing the bass. So this is a lick from that solo. He does a great job, again, of combining blues ideas right into some tasty bebop, and then right back into the blues. Cool. So it doesn't get more bebop than that 251 going to E flat.
that triplet figure where he plays all those little upper lower neighbor and closure type of things to me that's where it's at that is the language of bop and that's really what most of us want to get in our playing Okay, cool. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight about why I love JJ. Um, like I said, he is my favorite jazz trombone player and for my money, the most influential jazz trombone player to the style. Yeah, there's other great players out there, but for me, he is the foundation. So I hope you guys enjoyed these lessons. Um, as always, hit me with a comment, hit the like button, all that kind of good stuff, and we will see you in the woodshed. Take it easy.